crazy. Evolution was like, which one of these things do you want? And this caterpillar was like, yes. The abbot sphinx was like, I'll just take everything. Yeah, I just uh, just just give it to me. Whatever, I'll make it work. Including the the grape cluster mimicry. Hello, my beautiful and intellectually curious love bugs. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Nancy. I am an entomologist, which means that I study bugs. And normally, I'm doing tourism in Ecuador because that's where I live, focused on bugs and conservation. But obviously, that's not happened. So hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. Last week I did a video reacting to one of those like crazy fear mongering videos and I found that I was not only wrong once, which I managed to correct before it went out into the world, but I was wrong twice and the second one I didn't catch in time. But thankfully my audience is so kind and my friend Matt and also this commenter Joe also mentioned that I was wrong very kindly. And so today I will be correcting, and not only correcting, but expanding on the idea of these hawk moths that have these crazy eye spots and this beautiful snake mimicry. So I've invited my friend Matt, who's had a long time interest in hawk moth caterpillars in general, or hawk moths in general, to sit down and do this interview with me to talk about the wondrous world of snake mimicking hawk moths. I've also decided to do a thing where every video I will give you an ecological or entomological definition. Today's definition or word of the day is Batesian mimicry. And if you want to know what that is, check and wait to the end of the video. So without further ado, let's start talking to Matt. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to introduce my friend, Matt. So Matt, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, so I'm a undergraduate at University of Delaware and I study entomology. And aside from just my professional studies in university, I have reared insects and been interested in insects from a very young age, probably about two or three years old. And I've been raising uh, moths, uh, katydids, mantises, and various other insects for about almost 15 years now. So it's been a while. I think that's such an important thing to, to mention is that like everyone starts their journey at different at different times, even though you don't have like a master's or a PhD, like you're still really, really knowledgeable. And like, I go to you all the time, like, what the hell is this Katie did? What the hell is this Hawk Mod? I don't know. <laughs> I just sent it to you and you ID it. So thanks for all of that. <laughs> so do you have anything that you're rearing right now? Or do you have anything that you could show us? So what I have here is a late instar Final in star, so fifth in star, Akamon Sphinx. So this here, I'll just block the light for a sec so I can show the, yeah. So this is a fairly large caterpillar. It's full grown almost now. And they're pretty polymorphic. So you can have like any color form from this to brick red, to green, to dark green, to yellowish, to gold, to many other colors under that like spectrum. Yeah, thanks and, for mentioning why larval ID is so difficult. <laughs> yeah, exactly. People send me caterpillars all the time. I'm like, I don't know. You just got to wait till that shows up. And the adults all look the same. They're not polymorphic. Yeah, the adults are fairly the same. But I do have a similar species, Eumorpha pandorus, which is the pandorus sphinx. So this is in the same genus. And I don't have any caterpillars of them right now, but I do have females laying eggs. So this is an adult female. I also have an adult male, which is a bit more fresh. So oh, look at them. They're so beautiful. Oh, gorgeous. And I sort of woke them up from their sleep, so now they're, they're vibrating <laughs> their wings to pump that hemolymph so they can have enough flight power to be able to take off these huge fat bodies they have. These are fairly heavy moths. Oh, look at her face. Oh my god, so cute. <laughs> their eyes are, are really huge, and the reason that is because they need to be able to see all the flowers that they usually nectar. So she's flying around right now. So she just left, but she might be back. There she is. She's All right, so I wanted to move on. So last week I had showed a picture of what I thought was an elephant hawk moth caterpillar and was kindly um, notified that it was not. <laughs> so would you like to just kind of sh like show how you identified it or how you knew that I had shed up? <laughs> so the elephant hawk moth caterpillar is a species that's found throughout the old world, so in Europe as well as Africa and parts of Asia. And it's also sometimes migrating into uh, northern parts of Canada, and they have been found there, but I don't think there's enough of a population there to say that it's like native to no the region near North America. 
So this species is a snake mimic. This is, see, there's already a misidentification right here. This is a um, <laughs> Zolephanes species caterpillar. So you see the uh, elephant hawk moth caterpillar has these great big eye spots on the side of it. And then it's pretty like counter shaded brown and sort of almost scale texture on the sides. Not texture, but the pattern looks like scales. And then the species that you showed in your YouTube video was Hermera planis. And that is one of the ultimate snake mimic caterpillars, the Phytolin star caterpillar, and it's feeding right now. But when it gets disturbed or if it's just resting, it will twist itself around and then have these massive swollen thoracic segments. And on the underside, so on the ventral side, it has these eye spots. And the whole shape of the front of the caterpillar looks just like a viper. So I'd assume these would be mimicking anything in the genus Bothriopsis or Bothriacus, so like eyelash vipers and uh, palm pit vipers, basically. And they, they will even sway back and forth when you agitate them. And it looks just like a viper that is rearing back to strike. So it's a fairly convincing mimic and easily one of the best. It's been on the cover of National Geographic and a whole bunch of other uh, documentaries and magazines but just because it's such a poster child for snake mimicry. When I'm showing this image to a lot of different people, they're like, I kind of see the feet, I guess, but like, what am I looking at? Like, where is the like vulnerable head part of the caterpillar? So here we go. So the head capsule is right here. The little simple eyes are on the side. And then this is the end of the mouth. And then here are the three sets of true legs that are just like crumpled up right on top. So it sort of like just doesn't interrupt the shape that it's trying to make. And what I thought was also interesting that I hadn't really seen before when I looked at a side view, if I can find another. Yes, it even looks like it has heat pits. Those markings even make it look like it has heat pits, which most vipers of the palm pit vipers have very similar heat pit on the side of them and this looks just like it. it it is pretty plausible to say that these are imitating palm pit vipers there's like arifer and then there is just guatemalan pit vipers as well as eyelash vipers like this one and they just have like the general same appearance of just like the head shape as well as the coloration and they're both found in the same exact regions so like i said that what they do is they like turn around and then sway their head down and then sway back and forth like a snake would be rearing up to strike. So it's pretty convincing. I imagine you being the first person to ever like find that species and you just like try to pick up the caterpillar and you bother it and then it does this whole display where it like flips around and then like sways back and forth and you're just looking back at a snake. I can just like imagine some old timey like explorer just being like, what, the fuck? <laughs> what is this hellish continent? So this is the adult of um, Hemera Pliny. So this is the adult of the like the ultimate snake mimic and it's just like a very unassuming sphinx moth that you wouldn't think would have such an elaborate caterpillar and another thing to note is that it's not particularly the largest but the caterpillar does get quite long and the reason why it gets long instead of has more girth is so it can really perfect that palm pit viper mimicry is this the only genus that has these really amazing snake mimics in it so there are a few and most of them reside in the new world there are uh, a few genera in the old world, such as like Theretra and uh, like the, the elephant hawk moth Dilophila. I have never said that out loud because it's an old world species. <laughs> and um, there are a few others that mimic snakes, but mostly in the New World, so Central and South America, and even here in North America, there are some really impressive snake mimics. So I'll go over to the photos I have saved from. Um, this summer as well as snake of pillars that's amazing the pandora sphinx as caterpillars are uh, just like general eye spot mimics the final in star fresh final in star pandora sphinx and where the spiracles are a lot of sphingity they have usually markings over the spiracles to just like aid in the eye spot mimicry because this caterpillar is, is fairly just like brown and reddish brown and then it has a single eye spot just like this um Akamon sphinx has this sing let me just block this light single eye spot right at the end of its anal segment and um so they just have those spots down the side this moth is crawling my face right now and then <laughs> as when they're younger they do have the same 
uh, eye spot markings on the side of them where the spiracles are. So, so this is the, the same caterpillar, just a younger yes. instar. That's a, the Pandora Sphinx. So here's a wild fourth instar I found. It's still <laughs> the curly Q horn, which is a characteristic of a lot of the Eumorpha genus. And what they do is when they are disturbed, they can actually twitch the end of that segment and it like twitches the horn. That's cute. <laughs> but the ones in the tropics that have, that are in the same genus, so Eumorpha, such as Eumorpha forbis, Eumorpha labrusci, as well as uh, another species and a few others, what they will do is they actually have that eye spot at the end of them, but as final instars, they can actually twitch that enough to make it look like the eye spot is either shaking or blinking. So here is one of the species. This is not my image. This was pulled off of Google, but this is Eumorpha forbis. This was taken in Ecuador in Jasuni National Park, I believe. So this is Eumorpha forbis, and this is the end. So this is not the front of it. And it has this eye spot right here. And what it will do is it will actually like twitch the end anal segment and it will make the eye spot look like it's blinking. And it's pretty convincing. I would also like to show the um, another very convincing snake mimic. This is Eumorpha labrusci. So this is a, another in the same genus. And this is one that I found in Costa Rica. And it has this great big eye spot on its anal segments. And what it does, since it's on multiple segments, as you can see, there's creases right here. What the caterpillar will do is instead of twitching like the curly Q horn, it will twitch the eye spot and it will bend that segment and it will actually like blink at you, which is kind of neat because you don't usually see things like that. So here is this Eumorpha caterpillar with that eye spot on the back that's twitching and blinking. I have linked this YouTube channel and the blog that Matt sent me in the description below, but you can see that when I slow this down, how amazing and how just realistic that eye spot really looks. I mean, it absolutely, absolutely incredible. And there's another eye spot on it too, no? Like right yeah, kind of so on the, the side, they, they sort of look similar to um, the Hermera planis. So they have like the, the heat pit markings on the side and then they have this like eye spot that looks like it has like, it's gleaming. So it looks like it's sort of like very real. Here is um, another Eumorpha labrusci. So you see the characteristic curly Q horn of the Eumorpha genus when they're younger. And before it molts to its final instar, the spots on the side of the spiracles are green. And then it still has that big eye spot and then like some markings up here that make it a pretty convincing snake mimic. Cause even then it's large enough to look like a neonate snake. So a younger snake that is like just hatched basically. To my understanding, these are pretty decent mimics of just the Bothrops genus in general, which are the, um, like the Faraday Lances in Central America. So these guys. They're really common. I have seen a few and almost stepped on one. Very venomous. Very They're venomous. Responsible for, most, responsible for the most deaths every year in Central and South America. Indeed. Of the habits of laying inside like fields and where people are like growing things and, and picking crop and then they just step on them by accident. Always wear your boots, kids. Always wear your boots. So this is the, the um, Bothrops Asper, so like the Faraday Lance. And then a comparison of Eumorpha labrusci, which is easily, definitely trying to mimic the um, the Bothrops genus. Out of all the genera of um, venomous snakes, I would definitely guess that it's a Bothrops mimic. And the adult is right here, so it's very striking. Oh, how wow, beautiful. One of my favorite sphingidae of all time, by far. Gorgeous. And so it has like this really nice counter shaded green. So when it's resting, it just looks like leaves. But then when it flares up its uh, forewings to reveal the colors on the hind wings, it's got this nice blue and pale yellow and red. It's very striking. But I would give the ultimate eye spot award to Sfecundina abidi, which is a species Whoa. in Eastern North America. And this on the final instar, so let me show you a picture of the younger instars. So this is a fourth instar. And as fourth instars are like this powdery luminous blue white and the reason they're powdery like that is because they're imitating a i believe it's a dogwood sawfly just there's a species of sawfly that has the same orange marking at the end and it they always rest like that and they're apparently very toxic so these caterpillars have basically imitated them all of their fourth instar and then what they do is they molt and they have instead of the orange knob they have this really convincing eye spot marking and it's not only just a marking, it's like a physical. It's like a little knob. 
You can see your your camera flash off of it. Yeah, so this, what you can see is that it's like very shiny and it's like super bumpy and it's like a little button and it's squishy. So what will happen is if something tries to grab them because usually things try to grab where there's like a head or something, just like uh, hair streak butterflies will do this with the back of their, the hind wings on the tails. So also birds will go after that. The, um, the eye spot is like very squishy. And if you squish it, the caterpillar will return around and bite you. And it actually kind of hurts because their mandibles are fairly large. That bites and you? It will also That's crazy. Force, force air through its spiracles and make like a sort of like a squeaking sound, which is like pretty quiet, but enough that you can hear it as well as click with its mandibles. So it's kind of like a pretty impressive display for a caterpillar that's not that large. That's like, there's so many things going on there. Like it's not a lot of arthropods make noise by pushing air through the spiracles. Probably like the, one of the best examples is the hissing Madagascar and cockroach. And then like the fact that it bites you like caterpillars, like I've never been bitten by a caterpillar. Like most of the times they like, like, like sting you or something. The fact that it can make noise by like cr- putting its mandibles together and it has that button on its butt. Like that is, that is crazy. Evolution was like, which one of these things do you want? And this caterpillar was like, yes. The abbot sphinx was like, I'll just take everything. Yeah, I just, uh, just, just give it to me. Whatever, I'll make it work. Including the, the grape cluster mimicry. So what they, they mainly feed on... <laughs> They all feed on Vidiaceae, so they feed on grapes and Virginia creeper, and they will probably eat Cissus as well. And uh, so what they normally feed on in the wild is grape, and they will rest underneath the grape leaves, the green forms. So this is the green form. And it looks like a cluster of unripe grapes when it's just like curled up like that. So it's got like all these things going for it, that it has all these great attributes for mimicry. And it even has like the, the, um, the snake markings. So it sort of looked like it's this big eye and then it also has like scale texture markings. So it has quite a bit going for it, but still parasitoids and parasitic flies and wasps will always hit them, unfortunately. So they're not safe from everything, but they're pretty much safe from birds and other uh, visual predators. I think that's such an important note. Like I, when I bring up just these really amazing examples of mimicry, a lot of people are like, oh, but like, then what, like, how do we not have millions and millions of them? Like, and the answer is like disease and parasitoids and, you know, you're not, you're not protected from everything all the time. Even though like this thing, you're protected apparently from most things all the time. Yeah. And then there are other caterpillars that don't try to mimic certain uh, families or genera of snakes. They just try to just be look. They just have aposematic coloration to just look like a venomous snake or something that is very distasteful. And one of the best examples of that, that I'm sure Nancy, you have seen. I've seen it. I've seen everywhere. those. I took a picture of one of these, like, what, what are this? Like, what even is this? What the hell? <laughs> oh, here's and they a, have those long oh, little this, like tails. Like a squirrel cuckoo eating one. That's interesting. They, they eat everything. Yeah, of course it's eating one. But um, these are fairly toxic because they feed on... I don't know how to say it, frangipani, uh, plumeria flowers, which are grown a lot in Hawaii, but as well as uh, Florida. So they are found in Florida, but they have this like nice tricolored pattern going down, which basically is pretty reminiscent of just like coral snakes, so Mercurius in general. And there is a lot of different coral snakes in the neotropics. So there's a lot of different color forms to mimic. But since there's so many different ones, and if you're a caterpillar that just has the the telltale colors that it's like oh it's a talk it's close a venomous enough. thing it's close enough and it will it will probably scare away many predators i mean it's fluorescent yellow orange red and then it has these nice black interrupting of the bands and it also has a pretty long horn and i have found these in central america and what they do with that horn similarly to uh Eumorpha with the curlicue horn they will twitch it so it does sort of look like a snake's tail moving around Here's an old world. Uh, this is an Asian and African genus Daphnis. And if you look at the adults, they look very similar to the Pandora sphinx moths around here, which I am not sure of their whereabouts currently in my room. Uh, <laughs> but they are like basically the old world version of Eumorpha. And the caterpillars are look sort of like a snake mimic. So they have like these big eye spots in front. And they are fairly aggressive. They'll thrash around. 
and they have these nice colors on the side but you can just see these nice blue eye spots on them these are like old world zelephanies which is a new world genus and if i just search the larvae they are pretty decently similar to the elephant hawk moths level of snake mimicry they got the little eye spots on the side some species have eye spots all down their back oh, that's, cool. that's a pretty decent one oh, that's gorgeous that is really pretty but um that's one of the types of uh, sphinx moths in Asia that will sort of are borderline snake mimics. Like spice bush caterpillars, which are actually butterflies, have very similar kind of eye spots in the on the front of their head. Um, my favorite is the is the when the yeah the orange one like when it's yeah, the, the last instar. <laughs> it's like a that. shiny caterpie in, in real life. But yeah, so that's just a cool example to show that it's not just the hawk moths that have evolved this. Other species and have also evolved this ability to make eye spots. So you showed all these really amazing caterpillars that have these really amazing eye spots. But do you find like snake mimics in other life stages of butterflies or moths? Yes. So like some Saturnid moths have like really big eye spots or the sides of their wings like the classic example is the um, wingtips of like say the the atlas moth which is like the largest moth in the world but I'd only say it's in the top three largest because there is uh, the comet moth and then the hercules moth which can be larger in wing surface area and body mass but anyways that's another that would be another <laughs> that's video. A, like, we are going to fight about how we define a large on a different video <laughs> The internet always just says like the atlas moth is large, but there are some species that are larger, but the atlas moth does have wingtips where if you look at it, it looks like the side view of a cobra's head. So it's like very similar to that. And that would be pretty good to have because if you're a moth in the forest, you're just like sitting there and then you sort of have your wings either up or completely outwards. And then you just sort of like move them back and forth. It may look like to a, a visual predator, such as like a bird or a large rodent, that there is a snake nearby. And um, it definitely is more common in caterpillars in, in the larva form of moths and butterflies just because of the fact that uh, moth caterpillars, especially, they're just like extremely diverse in like shapes and sizes. And they just just react to literally any form of things that they can mimic. And then they will just perfect that somehow it, on some place on this planet. They will find a way. They'll find a way. Have you seen they, the chrysalis? It's a, it's a yes, invalid yes, that, butterfly. Yes, yes. Also, I would say that also is a, a Faraday Lance mimic, a Bothrops mimic, I'd say. But what's also interesting is that uh, some her, uh, herpetologists that have seen this photo have compared it to being almost identical to the markings on uh, Bytis gabonica, so like the gaboon viper in Africa, which is like, it literally looks almost exactly like a gaboon viper's head, but it's in the wrong part of the world. So maybe that lineage has been going on for so long that when the, when like the continents were connected, that it was just a general uh, viper mimic and it worked at the time. So just stuck with that, or it's just the markings are just like a coincidence, but I, I love it when you find like little kind of things that don't quite make sense like that. It's just crazy because you have like the yeah. Uh, it even looks like it almost has a pupil in it. It's just, it's so yeah, so beautiful. It is pretty incredible, and I'm sure that pupa can just like slightly sway back and forth by moving its abdominal segments, and I, that would definitely look like a, a viper that's just like moving to any predator that doesn't want to get too close. You have like opened my eyes to the wondrous world of these snake pillars. Well, Matt, is there anything else that you just wanted to, like, shout out to the world? Well, i just like to say that it's just pretty amazing that these animals that have such a short lifespan, in general even, because moths sometimes only live a week to, like, a month or so, and the caterpillars only take a month or two to completely grow from an egg to a final instar, that they have been able to perfect this mimicry over the course of millions of years of just like trial and error of just getting it in versus not getting it in and which markings work, which behavior works. It's just pretty fantastic just to see how the natural world has like crafted this where they even have mimicry of behavior of some venomous snakes versus behavior and also just appearance in general and even patterns. It's just completely mind boggling. 
it's I mean it's amazing what happens when you have like what 180 million years of evolution to throw at it I think that's when Lepidoptera evolved well thank you so much for hanging out with us today uh and yeah I just wanted to say thanks so much and this was a lot of fun and I, I hope was, to have you back sometime it was definitely a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed you having me. Thank you so much. Well, my love bugs, I hope that you enjoyed hanging out with Matt as much as I did today. If you want to follow Matt, you can follow him on his Instagram. I use photos from his Instagram all the time. Thank you. In these videos, so giving him support would be really nice. And you can also find him inside the Sci High, which is my Facebook entomology learning community, which is linked in the description below. And as our entomology word of the day, Batesian mimicry. Batesian mimicry is when a non-harmful organism is mimicking an organism that is harmful. And that's mainly just for protection and to scare predators. Let me know if it worked on you. All right. So I will see you next week with a, another video. But until then, you can watch a video from this playlist of Entomologists Explain Here, or you can watch last week's video where I react to some fear-mongering BS down here. All right, love bugs. I will see you next week. Bye.